I just want to thank our partners. Um, we could not have brought you all together without working with so many folks from the local chapters as well as some real key folks from the national um, organizations of the American Planning Association, the American Institute of Architects, the American Society of Landscape Architects, and the Urban Land Institute, as well as many partners in the academic and private and, and public sectors. Um, I also want to say that we've had just a fabulous response from our sponsors as well. Um, from Enterprise Community Partners, which helped to uh, recruit so many of our speakers. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate that. You don't even know. Um, as well as the Pew Charitable Trusts, Nelson Nygaard, Uber, Metro, Lyft, Kittleson & Associates, Ten Branch, Perkins & Will, PGE, Arup, International Society, excuse me, International City Managers Association, Mobility Lab, Fair & Piers, Via, Sarah, OTAC, Inova, Prosper Portland, Girdling Eden, Fourth and Moval, and I can't even believe I've got such a long list uh, to read off um, for our very first conference. Um, I'm really quite thrilled by that. Um, so uh, I just want to talk a little bit this morning about kind of what we've heard uh, over the last uh, few days um, and, and just share a few thoughts and a few photos. Um, and one of the things, this conference has really focused on the future and what is the future that we really want to build. And as a land use planner, I, I think about that a lot. Um, and it's a, it's a good reminder that the future is here right now. And um, I really realized that last September when I went to a, a conference to an event back in Washington, D.C. And I was walking down the sidewalk, and coming towards me is this uh, you know, terrestrial drone from Starship. You might have seen it at the conference. Uh, there was another one that was uh, going around. And um, you know when you have those moments, and you say to yourself, you see something, and you're like, oh my god, this is totally going in a PowerPoint presentation uh, really soon. So I'm pulling out my, my phone, and I'm talking to the handler that's walking behind this, this drone. And it, it's my first experience with automation in the wild. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, you know, what are you doing? And, and he's telling me how they're, they're testing them there in Washington, D.C. And he's the handler. Of course, he's not doing anything. Um, and they're making a Chipotle delivery. I'm like, wow, all right. You know, what's, what's going to happen when, you know, there's 10 other people that are making Chipotle deliveries or, like me, looking for eggs for the recipe that their son wants to make, those cookies that are really good? Um, and, you know, so what's it going to feel like when I'm walking down the street with my kids or my neighbor's walking their dog and, you know, and there's five or ten of these that are going down the sidewalk or they're making deliveries in downtown Portland at lunchtime, you know, what's, what's it going to feel like? Um, and the great thing, you know, this is what I'm thinking about and the nice thing is this is what you all are thinking about right now too and you're, you're definitely thinking about a lot of um, other topics also. So the conversations have been have been really fun. Um, so I'm just going to share a few, few of the photos. Uh, we've had a cadre of uh, University of Oregon students and other students and volunteers that have been taking pictures. And um, as one of the program organizers, I can't tell you how much relief I felt when I saw the photos from the workshop and realized you guys actually made it to where you were supposed to go. So that was really great. I was a little jealous as I was sitting downstairs in the convention center that some of you got to actually go and enjoy some of the sunshine out there. And uh, I realized there's been a real emotional reaction <laughs> to, the, to the topics of the conference. And I think that's Eric from Fair and Piers, and he's, he's looking a little pessimistic about the future. But Ron Milam, boy, he's optimistic. He's, good things are going to happen, I think. Um, and I still can't believe that Adam Beck and Chris Isles came all the way from Australia for, to do a workshop, and I kept on expecting them to cancel their workshop, like, they're not going to come. Um, but they came all the way from Australia to make this the first International Urbanism Next Conference. So uh, definitely thank you, you guys. <laughs> They've been really active on uh, Twitter as well, and so uh, Chris Isles, uh, he tweeted um, that there's going to be the next uh, planning nerd acronym, uh, Curb Entitlement, and Curb with a K. Is that an Australian thing? Um, and that is the belief by someone that they have a right to the access and use of the curb space outside their building exclusively to the exclusion of loading, pickup, and, and any kind of other functionality, which is really great. 
Um, so just a, a few more images um, from the workshops and from the conference itself. And some of the, the, the pithy quotes that I've, I've heard from folks um, throughout uh, the last two days, you know, I really liked that the city of Portland's uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler said that tech, technology is value neutral and people in cities are not. So how do we get the technology right? Um, I think it was Jillian Gillette in the uh, future of the curb session yesterday uh, that said, you know, we really need to start thinking of assets of the assets we have in cities and managing the curb as an asset. Uh, Noel Johnson, who was um, uh, on the e-commerce uh, panel on Monday, and he said, progress happens at the pace of trust. And that seems very true with all the conversations we've been having. Um, folks on Twitter have been very active. And so the folks at Cards Against Urbanity noted on Twitter, oh my god, the Human Driving Association is a thing. Um, I think it was Jeff Tomlin that said something to the effect of, we need to get the pricing structure right and then get the price right. Changing from zero cents to one cents is going to be much harder than changing the price from one cent to a dollar. I've heard folks um, in the different transit um, uh, sessions talk about um, the need to focus on increased access, not ridership. And then one of the speakers, I was noted, when they were talking about AVs and market penetration vis-a-vis -vis the introduction of automobiles, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said that they wanted faster horses, Henry Ford. Um, cities need to price for empty seats in order to price congestion equitably. And uh, one of the comments that I noticed on, um, on Twitter was at Urbanism Next, there has not been enough discussion about access for all. We need loading zones for ADA, the elderly, and children, that is easy. Um, some other folks that are thinking about um, e-commerce and retail and the future of retail stated, you aren't just buying a product, but you're buying an experience and an identity. And there's a shift away from commodities driving things to experience driving things. And the role of designers is that there's a huge opportunity for them and developers to create identity and a sense of place. There's definitely a lot of large opportunities and large risks, especially when it comes to equity. Uh, there was an interesting um, uh, a series of questions um, at one of the sessions, and a developer that was speaking um, asked, his, uh, asked the audience, what's the cost of not future-proofing your assets? And those are questions we should all be asking. Um, I think it was Ron Milam again that said, mobility on demand wants to sell us miles, and city and public agencies want to reduce miles. And these two forces are in direct uh, competition. <clears throat> Jeff Tumlin explained it well when he stated, we need to be telling better stories about the future of mobility. And that starts with understanding the potential impacts and illustrating the opportunities. Someone on Twitter said, build the city you want to live in. Copenhagen gave the curb to the bicycle. Do we want to give the curb to AVs and TNCs? Build the city you want to live in, and the technology will adapt to it. And finally, as we watch the last of the slides, someone on Twitter said, I think it's one of my favorite tweets, um, hearing so many good insights from Urbanism Next 2018, y'all are making us transportation geeks who couldn't make it feel jealous. So I guess um, some of the takeaways that, you know, that we've been saying in so many of our presentations is that all of these topics, you know, e-commerce is not an a retail issue, it's an everything issue. And AVs are not a transportation issue, um, they're an everything issue too. That all of these issues that technology um, and all the changes that it is bringing to us um, are really are connected to so many other things. And you know, we're gonna start to see the dominoes, we're already starting to see those dominoes fall. And so the question I think you know, we're all asking now is you know, really what does happen next? I think we've been asking some really great questions and we've been theorizing about what the future holds. Um, but now we really uh, need to start talking about the changes that are happening and what could happen in the future. And 
I don't know about you, but definitely as a researcher and as an organizer of this conference, I'm already starting to think about who I'm going to be recruiting to come back next year. And even just this morning in the shower, I was thinking that I really need to, uh, to talk to Alex Pazuchanix from the city of Pittsburgh. Alex, are you here yet? Excellent. Well, if you're not, I'm going to be talking to you because I'm hoping he knows somebody from the city of Phoenix. And I'm thinking that we need to get them together with Uber and Waymo and have a session next year, kind of like couples counseling. You know, like, what did you wish you knew about your autonomous partner before they moved in? And Waymo and Uber, did you find that there was a lot of house rules that were hard to follow? Or were your new city partners pretty laid back? I'm also really excited to see some new behavioral studies from UC Davis that we can, so that we can better understand what the heck people are going to do with this technology and how it's going to really change their behavior. And even just last night, I was talking to Ian Carlton from Echo Northwest, and I'm not going to get this exactly right, but he was saying that some of their modeling shows that if a city gets rid of its parking, then the market's going to respond with a much denser, transit-oriented city. And it's basically the equivalent of a city like the um, city of Las Vegas spending about $100 billion on transit. You get about the same result. And so I did ask him, what do you think is uh, more feasibly, uh, politically feasible of the two, getting rid of parking or spending $100 billion on transit in Las Vegas? And I'm, I'm not quite sure which one is. Um, talking about topics that we are hoping um, uh, to hear of next year, we will be sending out an evaluation over the next day or two, and definitely stick with it to the end because I really want to hear what you want to hear next year. So, um, so definitely let us know. And um, now that we've had two days to chew on all these meaty topics, um, I think we all want to know really what does happen next. And so, for the rest of this morning, you know, we've asked uh, leaders from industry and research and per the professions, as well as government, um, to come and talk about what these secondary impacts of the emerging technologies are going to be, and talk about how we actually create those solutions and those best practices. Um, one of the things that I know that we're all going to have to do is really build the political will to raise the awareness of these issues uh, with the community members and with civic leaders and have those conversations so that we can make those types of decisions. It's critically important to be able to communicate to the public, um, to elected leaders, um, and to the business community and all the folks that are gonna, have to, are gonna be impacted by these changes. Um, and so I'm really pleased to uh, bring on our next speaker, Donna Davis, who's gonna be talking about strategic communications. Um, it's such a thrill for me to work at the University of Oregon, uh, where there's so many professionals that can really speak to all of the different um, topics and interests that people have. Uh, I know I really want to go back. One of the first conversations I'm going to have is with the folks in the economics department and think about, you know, what are the impacts on labor to the four million people who are drivers in this country? And how is the retail sector going to change and the three and a half million people that work in retail and how many of those um, are actually going to be able to shift to different um, jobs in retail or what are the retraining opportunities there? Um, but Donna, uh, has just been wonderful to work with um, here at the, the University of Oregon and the whole um, journalism and communications uh, department. Uh, she is the strategic communications program director and an associate professor. She has more than 25 years experience in public relations, fundraising, and nonprofit communication to the classroom, including 10 years as a producer and host of Family Album Radio, an award-winning daily two-minute radio program distributed through NPR leading corporate support efforts for NPR and PBS affiliates at the university, and working with a number of state, national, and international environmental organizations. And with that, um, I would uh, please encourage you to help me welcome Donna Davis. <laughs> 